Okay, we're recording, Andy. Please go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to call the Finance Committee meeting to order for November 17, 2023. Um, and then after I do that, um, I'm going to uh, ask Austin to, uh, to uh, call the uh, meeting of the trustees to get uh, order because uh, he is a quorum uh, of his committee present and uh, Lynn is uh, keeping an eye out to see if we end up with a uh, a quorum of the council and then we'll have to pause to do that too. But uh, this meeting is being uh, recorded. Uh, we are holding it virtually um, as is permitted by the open meeting law, but it's being recorded both for audio and visual purposes, so you should be aware that um, we are doing recording of this meeting, and I'm going to call on the members of the um, Finance Committee to make sure that they can hear and we can hear them, and then we will, um, uh, I'll turn it over to Austin for a moment to call the trustees to order. Uh, so I think we still don't have Anna here. You do uh, have a quorum, Shalini is here. We do have a quorum. Uh, okay, so Lynn is going to have to, uh, in a minute, I'll call Lynn too. Um, but Lynn, you're, you, we can hear you, I assume? Yes. Okay. Uh, Bob Hegner? Here. Matt Holloway? Here. Uh, Bernie Kubiak? Here. Kathy Shane? Here. And Alicia Walker? Here. Okay, so um, I'll note that uh, all of the current, all of the members of the committee who are present, which is all but um, one at this point, um, can hear and be heard. And I'm going to, um, since we, I, we now have a quorum of the council present, I'll turn it over to Lynn for a moment. Seeing that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the town council to order on uh, November 17th, 2023 at 105. I wanna make sure that Mandy Johanneke, you can hear us. Present. And uh, Michelle Miller, you can hear us. Present. And Shalini Balmill. Present. Okay, thank you. Austin, do you wanna? Thank, thank oh. you. Thank you, Andy, calling the meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees to order uh, Farah. Here. Bob. Bob Pam. You need to unmute. You're muted. Thank you, Bob. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Lee Edwards. Present. And Austin Sarrett. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Tammy's, Tam here. Tammy's here too. Oh, I didn't see Tammy. And Lynn, Pam Rooney just joined. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tammy, you want to indicate that you're here? Unmute. Tammy, please unmute. Can you speak, Tammy? Okay, she's she's indicated she's here by raising her hand. Okay. Pam Rooney, uh, you hear us. I can. Thank you. Okay, so let me explain. Um, thank everybody for attending and uh this uh, meeting is going to really focus on the question of uh, that's being presented regarding library and uh, bond authorization. And I'm going to turn it over to Paul in a minute, who's going to um, lay the context uh, based on the memorandum that he gave to the council on Monday uh, is sort of the first part of the introduction. And uh, then we'll uh, we have an order that we're going to proceed with. But um, the, as I said, the finance committee is probably not going to be able to do much um, afterwards because I think this is going to be a fairly thorough discussion of one item. Uh, so, Lynn, were you going to add anything? Or yes. 
uh, first of all, Tammy, could you lower your hand, please? Uh, so uh, given that we have not been able to put all of the documents into the packet until the last hour, uh, we are not expecting the Finance Committee to take a vote to recommend to the Council today, uh, which means on the 20th of November, while there will still be a public forum with regard to the library at seven o'clock, along with the other financial orders, mm -hmm. the actual, any further vote on the library, the earliest that it would happen is December 4th, uh, when the council meets again. Meantime, the finance committee is meeting again on November 20th at two o'clock and on December 1st at one o'clock. Okay, thank you. I think so, you meant, was it the 20th, Lynn? Yeah. Or 28th? I'm sorry, November 28th. Thank you. At yeah. at 2 and December 1st at 1. And I believe somebody else just joined, but I'm trying to see who it might be. And I don't see anybody. So I'm going to uh, ask Paul, did you want to do anything in the way of introduction in your presentation? Sure. Anna, excuse me, Paul. Anna has joined. Do you want to make sure, Andy, she can hear? Anna? Uh, we just Hi. Need... Okay, we just wanted to confirm that you... <laughs> Thank you. Sorry us. for my lateness. I am present. No, that's fine. Uh, Paul, sorry. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So this is, uh, thank you for considering this order and for the council and for all of the elected officials and appointed officials who are here today. It's really appreciate the effort you're putting in on a Friday afternoon. Um, this is a request for an appropriate the sum of $9,860,100 for the expansion and renovation of the Jones Library. This is on top of the original uh, projected cost of $36,279, um, which included a local share of $15,751,810. That local share is not changing in terms of the appropriation. Um, I don't want to, I don't need to go into details. Everybody is very familiar with the library project. Um, these, this number, the $46 million number is from the most recent cost estimates that we have from two different um, cost estimators and Bob Parent, our special co capital projects person is here to help if there are any questions about how we arrived at that number. Um, and it's, and it, we think it's pretty solid and it includes all the inflationary um, projections that we can possibly include and, ba and also incorporates all the inflation that happened mostly because of the pandemic. Um, and so we think that this is is the number. It's, it's the number we are asking you to approve. Um, and and then with this vote, this project can proceed to the next phase, which is bidding the project and then contracting with someone to start the build. And I think I'll just leave it there. We have more information to share about uh, the the cost projections and things like that, but that's the next phase. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, there are There is new material that has been produced today, as Lynn previously indicated, that has been added to the Finance Committee packet for today's meeting. Uh, Athena is also going into uh, any council packet or other locations for people who are looking for it. I haven't added the last minute items from the finance committee meeting to the council packet on Monday yet, but everything is in the finance committee packet for today. And that is available on the website and for, That's correct. for committee members, it's available on the finance committee SharePoint for everybody. It's available, including the public, it's available on the finance committee page of the town website. So with that, um, what we're going to do is um, next um, talk about um, one of the new items, um, which is a new cash flow analysis, which really um, responds to a number of the questions that were asked. And I'm going to ask Lynn, um, who was working uh, with our staff and with uh, our uh, Dave, Dave Eisenthal to um, produce it. So, uh, I, Lynn, I'm 
turning the meeting over to you for the moment so that we can get an introduction and make that presentation. And but I guess I should ask Pam, do you have your hands up for a question? Yes. Could someone point me to that document in the packet? I'm not seeing it and I would like to see it in a screen that's large enough to read. What is the title of it? It is, uh, hold on one second. It is called uh, Finance, Jones Library Projection Revision to November 17th, 2023. So Lynn, go ahead. Uh, okay. And Athena, you need to make me co-host. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you is actually, um, hold on, just be patient with me, is the following breakdown. And the reason I'm showing you this is because in the sheet I'm going to show you in a minute, it's not exactly in this order. The total cost of the project, as we've discussed, is 46.1 million. The town share is and remains at 15.751 million. MBLC share, which started out somewhere in around 13 something, is now increased because there is a sixth payment, and that is 15 million five. The CPA is a million. That leaves the trustees with the goal of raising 13.822 million, 13.822 million. Being fair to the trustees, however, I wanna make sure you understand they have been extremely active in increasing the amount for MBLC and they wrote the proposal for CPA. So in many ways, the dollars that are included here and in here belong to the trustees as well to the whole town. Again, the total project is as follows. Going to take that down and we're going to go to the cash flow. Um, and I will try to make this as large as I can, but I also want to ask Jennifer LaFontaine, who is one of the co um finance directors and thank her for her work today and yesterday and the days before. And also David Eisenstall, who is our financial advisor to the town. I'm gonna to try to increase the size of this in a moment. Um, are you still seeing it on the screen and is it any bigger? It is yes. bigger. Yes. Okay, great. Just about. Okay, so one of the things I wanna point out on this is a couple of things. First of all, we're gonna go through what the MBL, MBLC is going to give us and when it's expected they will give us. When will the CPA money kick in? When will the other donations kick in? And I wanna point out that this is an estimate and needs to be further checked with the trustees, but it does not change the bottom line. I also want to point out that, as you will see, exact actual expenditures are just beginning, if you will, in, in this line right here. So while we have been receiving money, we haven't been spending any money. And that is because MBLC and the library have started paying us in advance. And they continue to pay us in advance as they have money. So, you know, MBLC sometime around um, February of next year gives us another 2.7 million. We estimate that the library sometime around here will give us another million. So we don't actually get to the point that we are borrowing any money until April 30th of 2024, based on this spreadsheet. And that's important because when you're not borrowing money, you're not recruiting, you're not incurring any interest. At the same time, for the MBLC money and any other money given to us by the library, we will actually be earning interest. And it is a requirement that that interest 
has to then be placed back into the project. So just to give you an example, we haven't accounted for it here, but we've already earned about $60,000 on the money that the MBLC has given us. So keeping in mind, we don't even have to start borrowing until we are out of the money that people have given us. And that is not again until April of 2024. So as you go through the cash flow, you'll see CPA money comes in here. Or I'm, I'm sorry, CPA is here. Here's estimated donations from the library. And the way this has been structured from the very beginning is that by the time we finish the project and the library takes occupancy and we finish the last payment from MBLC, at that point, MBLC will have, have provided us with a total of 15.56. We will have the million of the CPA and the library because they have now dealt with banks and had a discussion with banks and with mass development, they will not be asking the town to float their debt. They will float their own debt whatever is left for the fundraising. And in floating their own debt, they will not be putting their endowment at risk. So when you get done at that point, what you have is the only thing that we are borrowing on is in fact the money that the town is lending. So let me just mention again, as construction happens, you keep borrowing, but only as you need it. And at some point you then consolidate, usually at the end of construction, you consolidate your loans into one final loan. And in fact, if more favorable interest rates are available, you can refinance that depend on the, depending on the conditions of the loan. So when you go down to this page on this, you actually can see that the actual interest on the loan is Seven thousand nine hundred and forty-four dollars, three eighty-nine. This is million. Me, million. Thank you. Seven million. Thank you, Kat. Um, and that is a that's the, if there's any difference between that and what we estimated in the past, it's only because interest rates are different. So one of the big questions that people have been asking is, well, how much it more, how much is this additional cost going to cost the town? And the reality is because the library will be paying the town all of their share by 2027, MBLC will be paying all of their share by 2027. The town will not be paying on any more interest on anybody else's money, but ours. And that's the number right there that's estimated. So I'm going to take this down for the minute, unless Andy, you can be on the alert for questions if people have them, since this was one of the most interesting. I also want to ask um, Jennifer LaFontaine and uh, David if they would like to uh, state, uh, add any comments to this. Well, uh, you know, I think that um, I mute before I can respond to you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my understanding of this is that, in fact, uh, there will perhaps be a need for cash flow borrowing by the town mm -hmm. um, in, you know, to in advance of when MBLC grants and donations are received. The column on the on the uh, first page that shows bands, uh, you know, the, the town that it would issue if you go, so the 15 million, seven fifty one eight ten that's the town's local share. The next column to the right shows uh, bands that I'm understanding would be issued by the town um, in advance of um, the grants from MBLC and donations being received. So there, there. My understanding is there would be short-term interest uh, payable on that, but th that ultimately the principal on that would be paid entirely from those donations and MBLC grants, and that's reflected on the next page. And David, it might be good for you to introduce yourself in terms of how many years you've been with the town and what you're, who you work for, so people okay. understand. Sure, sure. <laughs> who you are? Uh, I think many of you probably know 
me, but I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Uh, my name is David Eisenthal. I'm a vice president with Unibank Fiscal Advisory Services. I've worked with the town for literally decades, uh, helping the town finance uh, capital projects. Um, and, um, you know, I've been working with Paul and Jennifer for uh, on this project and other projects that are coming down the road here for um, a couple of years anyway. So uh, these are, uh, we've been running a lot of numbers and, you know, a lot of iterations, but, you know, that's, um, you know, the, the, I think the numbers are coming together at this point, so. I guess the only thing uh, just, and anybody who doesn't know, a ban is a bond anticipation note. Yes, and uh, if so, I use uh, acronyms uh, unnecessarily, uh, please call me out on that. I'm I do want to make this as user friendly as possible. And uh, those are shorter term notes that are um, issued so that cash is available during construction. And then at the end of the construction, everything can be rolled into one single financing instrument that can be sold uh, in, in an appropriate fashion. And that's what David right. is uh, our expert on. Right, and I'll, I'll just say that because I will point out that what we're assuming here is that the local share financing is act would actually be done reasonably early in the project, uh, you know, in the spring of 2024. Um, and I don't know that, you know, we, we can look at different ways to structure this, but I'm assuming that we, that the town could do a permanent financing at that point, because the permanent, the local share financing isn't financing the last dollars of the project. Uh, in fact, you're going to be receiving uh, the last dollars really are going to be financed by the donations and the MBLC grants. Uh, with the town um, s stepping up on a short-term basis, the, you know, uh, as Mr. Steinberg points out, yet the bond anticipation notes are usually issued in advance of bonds, but in this case, um, the expectation is that these would be paid off with the uh, proceeds of the donations and uh, the MBLC grants. So with that, um, I am going to turn to um, questions on this aspect of it. We did not do public comment, and I will get back to public comment later, but I, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do a couple of presentations uh, before we do public comment. But I just want to assure anybody who's watching and was intending to comment that they have not been forgotten. Kathy, uh, you had your hand up, and I, was, I wanted to recognize people uh, from the council and uh, finance committee and the council, uh, and actually trustees, if anybody has questions uh, from the group that's uh, present at the meeting, uh, please let me know, but we'll start with Kathy. Uh, thank you. Um, Len, Unless I missed it, the document I'm looking at is not in the packet yet. So I have a re just a general request so that I can scroll if you could put it in the packet. Um, so now I'll ask specifics on what I can see on the screen. Um, one is uh, you said the library will be making us whole by taking a bank loan against presumably their endowment. So they're going to, you use the term, float the debt. So I'd like to know how much they're going to take on and what that means in terms of the draw on the library endowment. In the Q&As, I saw that you told us that the endowment is about $8 million, a little bit under, and that each that we're expecting to take about 350,000 of it toward the operating budget. So my first question is about the library um, floating this loan for us against their endowment with a bank loan. So I wanna understand that better. My second, if you can scroll down to the first line that David referred to on the bands, uh, just way up at top is where you see the band. Go up a little bit more. It goes, it's up. There are two, there's a line on the 50. It's, 
or maybe it's, da it's down, it's the next page. That's the page, just freeze, freeze it there. So what he said is taking out um, it, uh, actually three, three fairly substantial bands. Um, when we looked at this in 2021, the band total was around $5 million. Um, and we never saw the interest on that. So who pays, these are very short, uh, they're actually a little bit longer. Don't who who pays the interest on the seventeen point one million, the twelve point eight million, and the one point seven million? So the principal, as I understand it, is going to be paid back to the town by this flow of money into it. But in the meantime, it's carrying a four percent interest, and the first one, the biggest, is carrying it for a year. The second is carrying it for a year. And the third is carrying it for a year. Last time, David, you did these last time, I think, working with Sean. They were six-month notes. They were, when you say short-term, they were really short. So if I do 4% times these bases, I can get what the interest rate roughly would be. Um, who's paying that interest? That's my Second question. I think I understand the rest of the presentation. Uh, Paul, do you Kathy, want to go into that or shall I? Kathy, I sent you the link to the document in the packet. It is posted. Okay, thank you. So this this is built into our capital, comes out of our 10.5% capital fund, basically, is where it comes from. And that's in, I think Sean included the uh, pretty close to these numbers in the projection that's in the capital improvement program. So, so Paul, you're telling me the interest on the bands is, you know, in JCP, what we've been carrying was the 36 million with the 15.8. And at the point, the point uh, since I'm on JCPC, I've been looking at that line, the 15.8 was an interest rate of 4.2.8. And I realize we can't mm -hmm. do anything about that. And then the bands were very short term being carried at two. So this the combination of these two things. Um, and I'm going to ignore the 15.8 right now. That's okay. our obligation. I'm just focusing on the bands. So we're taking on, um, if I add them up, a pretty substantial short term with interest on it. So are you saying that the town will be paying that interest? Typically, that's how it would work. And I shouldn't, you, you said it's, it's, it's a one year ban and then it's a six month ban and then it's a, uh, like a almost a year, eleven month. Ban. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. So yeah. one year ban, I can just say four percent is this. The second yeah. one, I can take half yeah. of it. And the third, I mean, I can do the rough yeah. math on that to say we can we can work on that for you as well, and, and also address your question on that. So with that answer, is there any way the library could be at risk for that interest? Since in effect, the town is at risks, not just for the 15.7 total principal and debt, but for the interest on this. This is just the reason I'm remarking on it is last time it was it's a much bigger number <laughs> and it's carrying a much higher interest. So could we separate that and make that an obligation a library? And that goes with my first question on how much of an obligation is the library already taking on and floating the debt? So, Paul, um, if I could enter into this, yeah. the amount of money that needs to be taken out will depend on how fast the library collects their promises on their um, various uh, things, including their grants and including their historic tax credits. If they collect it faster and they give it to us faster, then these aren't, aren't going to be as large. So that's number one. The second thing is, this is the same way it works with the school, Kathy. We continue to carry the debt and we only reduce the debt as we get money from MVLC. So, if, I mean, from, um, from MSBA. So this is how it works with any other project where the, when the source of funds are being given to you over time, the town carries the debt. Um, leaving the issue of the library loan uh, Austin, you have your hand up. Did you want to answer that or do you want to wait until later? Happy to answer it now. Okay. 
So Kathy, uh, thank you for the question. It's a, it's a very good question. It's one that we have thought about a lot. And uh, the answer to the question is, of course, it depends. So we don't yet know how much we're going to need to borrow. So how we carry that debt and what it does to the financing of the library will ultimately depend on how much we need to borrow, what the interest rate we can get on what we need to borrow, and how long we can borrow it for. Um, the trustees are operating in a little bit of uh, the, you know, an information deficit because we don't know how much we are going to need to borrow. That will depend upon the success of the capital campaign. It's our hope that and our expectation that we can carry debt and do the debt service without significantly adversely affecting uh, the operations of the library. It's our hope that we can carry the loan and do the debt service without having to further obligate or further diminish um, the endowment. Uh, why is that? Again, as you know, the endowment grows and we want to keep the growth in the endowment. And some of this also, Kathy, as you know, is affected by what's in the endowment at the time that we need to do this financing. So the market goes up, the market goes down. We have a conservatively, relatively conservatively managed um, endowment and are confident that we have the right management strategy. So I can't give you the exact answer because I don't know what the exact figures will, um, uh, will be. Andy, if am I allowed to follow up? I just what what I'm For trying. Moment, then I need to get on the map. But go okay, ahead. And I, I, I got the answer to that. What I'm trying to get at is the financial risk to the town. So I understand you hope all of these pieces. So just keep that question in mind. You know, I'm not going to ask you for more information. I'm I really so I'm trying to grapple with the financial risk to the town, given that 15.8 is what we said we would do, and we know we we're going to pay interest on that. The short-term obligations have gone up a lot because of the flow of funds, um, and we always said we weren't going to go more than 15.8, and the big difference here, Lynn, it, on the school is quite dramatic. I mean, we presented the whole thing, and 98 has not gone up. It's been great, and I think we've got enough contingencies. So I'm going to stop there. So I'm just trying to get at the risk the financial risk to the town, meaning dollars, um, not, you know, both known dollars and potential dollars. If the library can't do what you're hoping to do on the endowment or the funds don't come in quite as quickly, you know, how much can you, Bob said 1.5 million could be taken out of the endowment, but he cringed at the word of 5 million, you know, so, and I can see with an 8 million, you want to be really careful. So I'll just leave it at that and cede my turn. Okay. So I'm going to continue on with members of the committee and the council and Matt. Thanks, Andy. And thank you, Kathy, for drawing the attention to this. I was, I had similar questions about the bands and the um, interest rate. So I think you know, I, I think I've heard um, what I needed to hear on, on that. Uh, I just want to thank um, Paul and the staff for, for getting this in our hands. I realize that we haven't had a ton of time to study it, but I do think that, you know, a lot of the conversation that we've had so far has been, um, you know, looking at everything as a instantaneous when, of course, you know, so much of this borrowing is structured over time. Um, and I just find it to be very, very helpful to see it on the timeline like this and um, glad it's going to get publicly posted. So I just I wanted to just ask about the um, the final the final payment coming from the donations other from the trustees. So that's the um, July 31st, 2026, eight million three hundred thousand and change there. Um, that number is is the result of some of the assumptions that we made around the payment over time, it, just uh, Paul or or others who, who wish to speak to it. So how do we come to that to that final number for the for the trustees as opposed to moving some of their spending up earlier in the in the um, timeline? I think the trustees can answer this, but it's based on their fundraising schedule and what they think they can raise and when they can raise it. And there's the the that bottom number is. Uh, that's sort of the catch-all number where they hope that they the, um, 
most of the grants come in. And if not, that's where the, the, um, the uh, trust fund is the security blanket for the town. And I think from the trustees point of view, not to speak for them, but you know, they have said, well, how do we protect our endowment? And that's why Mr. Pam has gone to banks and s secured, um, had p positive conversations with them about, suppose we didn't want to just jeopardize our endowment, how would we manage that over time? And time is our friend on these things. That's how you manage debt like this. And, you know, what the town has said is we're, we want to, we want to end our, we want to, our financing ends with the 15.8 and it's on June 30th, 2027. And then it flips to this, to the trustees. Andy, quickly, before you move to the next question, can we please confirm that Dorothy Pam can hear and be heard? She joined us recently. Dorothy. Really a question that Lynn needs to know because Dorothy, can you hear? Uh, yes, I can hear. Okay. Uh, because Lynn is keeping track, we have the quorum of the council present also. Um, Austin, but, but, but I but I have a previous meeting that I must go to at two o'clock. Okay. Okay. Scheduled months ago. Uh, uh, Austin, there are a couple of people in the audience um, who have been involved in the fundraising, Ken Farber and Jenny Hamilton. If you would like you, any of them brought into the um, meeting to uh, respond to any questions, you should just let me know. I'm going to leave that to your discretion. Will do. Thank you. Uh, Bob Hegner. And please unmute. Sorry about that. Um, this has been very helpful for 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 me personally. Um, I have a question about the impact of this borrowing on our ability to do other capital projects. Um, in other words, I presume that the borrowing that we're doing for the elementary school is going to be paid for by the debt exclusion tax increases that we have um, that we voted on. Um, Tell me if that's not a correct assumption, um, but um, would this borrowing in any way impact our ability to do the other capital projects um, in the, you know, in the, in the sort of near term, uh, you know, in the next five years, could we start one of, one of the other two projects? So, it's, so yes, it does have an impact because it's mon more money. Um, so clearly that that is the case. I think we have not program. I have not, we have, haven't placed this on the entire schedule because the other two projects are still in flux as well. And, you know, uh, you know, Sean had worked up a different plan, you know, uh, to, a, to a certain extent where, it, and one of the reasons we established the capital um, stabilization plan was to develop a, a savings account to pay, try to pay as much cash as possible for one of those two projects. Right. Um, so I don't think this has significant impact on that because again, we built, we our strategies are solid of building up our capital contribution to 10 and a half percent. And that is the reason we've done that is to be able to take on this additional debt. Um, and that, that will grow over time as well, the 10 and a half percent. Thank you. So are there are other questions on the topic we're at. Show me. Um, and you can let me know if this is not the right time to ask this question, but as I'm trying to grapple with all of these numbers, um, like we know there have been delays, there's been COVID, all of these things that have led to the increase in the costs that were outside of the control of the library trustees and and now they have to face the consequences of that, some of which is not their fault, but this is where we are. So my question, though, is the repairs cost has also gone up. And so wouldn't us paying for the repairs have a similar cash flow impact? Uh, we're actually going to be talking about the repairs with the next presentation. 
uh, because uh, we've also had somebody who's uh, developed that information for us. So you might want to just uh, let uh, Bob Parent know, note that question and maybe he can come back to it when he makes the next presentation. Thank you. Bernie? Yeah, Andy, as we move along and launch into the question of repairs, I want to uh, just ask that everyone keep in mind that uh, essentially two thirds of the voters of the town um, agreed that the library needs the renovations and the expansion. Uh, and I think uh, this is all helpful because we want to keep moving towards meeting that goal that the voters have supported. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, interest costs uh, two years out if um, everything works the way it's supposed to work and all the uh, all the all the the uh, tea leaves are red, those interest rates are likely to come down. Um, but uh, it seems to me that, you know, looking at the bands uh, doing back in the envelope ca calculation, it's uh, uh, a million dollars over two years, uh, three years. So not horrible, uh, not welcome, but but not horrible. So thank you. So uh, seeing all their hands right now, um, Paul would, uh, I guess it is sort of, Kathy, before you have a question before I may go to the repair question. Yeah, I just want to build a little bit on Bob Hegner's question. So, Bob, you asked with a reference to DPW and the big capital, but this, the 10.5 we're putting into the capital cash flows, this has a big impact on that. And that's the, that cash flow is what we does building repairs, buys vehicles, and does roads. And so, um, as everyone has said, we can't really do anything about the fact that interest rates are higher than they were before. But I just did a quick calculation on those three bands, which are also much higher. So it's another six hundred and eighty-two thousand in the first year, another two fifty-five in the second year, and sixty-seven in the third year, on top of the principal and interest for Jones. So when we get the JCP world, when we get our revised, how much left do we have to spend out of the ten point five percent? It's going to be less. You know, it, it'll just be less and. And so I just I just want to say that it's not just the pulling down on reserves. We had a financing plan that was paying principal and interest. So it's real money is another way. And my last question, uh, Paul, uh, Andy, and as, as far as I can see, the furniture and equipment budget is a lot lower than when we saw it in, in 2021. And when I say a lot, almost a million dollars. So I'm, I'm my the bluntest way is is the library coming planning on coming back to us to supplement the furniture. And when I say furniture and equipment, AV, uh, others. Um, so I went back to look the 21 numbers, and those had been lowered by 400 thousand, and now they're down again. So these are just pure budgets. So it's a question. Again, I'm just focused on risk to the town, on you know what uh, what kind of mm -hmm. costs we're covering. That's it. Well, I, I, if you don't have anything, I'm gonna turn to Lee Edwards. Just all right. Now you can see my face. I mean, at the risk of seeming unconscionably naive, I will repeat what the trustees have been saying since forever. We are obligated to raise the money for everything beyond what the town has already committed. And that includes for furnishings and fixtures. Um, and beyond that, the town will always have needs ongoing. I think the question where we began is there were four capital projects and can the town commit to having the resources to deal with those four capital campaign projects? 
I have heard before that the answer was yes. I think in this discussion, the answer is still yes, although it would be helpful to hear it reiterated. The other needs, the ongoing needs of the town are, to me, kind of outside this discussion. But to repeat where I started, the trustees and the fundraising committee are in with all four feet to raise the money beyond what the town has committed. And based on our track record to date, I'm confident we'll do this. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Dorothy? Okay. Um, I may have missed this, but is the plan to turn the historic director's office into the place for the new $400,000 book sorter still there? Uh, this is related to Kathy's questions about the money for furniture, which keeps getting cut and cut, and the furniture isn't just furniture, so that we can't just say, I'll lend you a chair or give you a couch. Um, the costs have gone up. I see nothing that suggests the costs will go down. Um, that has not been the direction. And when people talked about ongoing project problems related to the four capital projects, um, I was reading somebody's testimony recently about the state of our sewer pipes. And um, there is just so much maintenance in this town, which needs to be done. Not that doesn't even include the new fire department or the new DPW, but the maintenance. So I, I am quite concerned and I'm I'm hoping to see some efforts to scale back the project. Um, we know the town wants the library fixed. I agree with that, okay? And I think we all appreciate the work that the fundraising committee has been doing, but the ongoing fiscal situation suggests that there's not gonna be any magic coming. And today when I, heard on the plan that the loan from the library endowment was being counted on. I thought that was a backup plan. I didn't know it was something that was being counted on from the beginning. Oh. So that was quite a shock to me. So the, my answer is, are some adjustments being made in the plan in order to deal with the fiscal realities? Thank you. Austin. So um, again, I appreciate the, um, I appreciate the, question uh let's start with the book sorter uh the book sorter was moved as the plan developed the location of the book sorter has been reviewed by the amherst historical commission they had no problem with it where the location of the book slot is they actually preferred it so from the point of view of historic preservation the Historical Commission has no problem with what our plan is for the for the book sorter. So that's number that's number one. We've thoroughly investigated the book sorter issue. Should we use it? Should we not use it? And we've come to the conclusion that it is a prudent thing to do. Over time, the book sorter will save on costs that would have had to go to staff. So that's uh, I think about the um, about the book sorter. Second, the phrase is scale back the project. So uh, the building committee of which the town manager and others serve went through a value engineering uh, exercise, which involved scaling back on the project. We've come to the point where we believe that the project that we have is the project that both the library needs and the town needs, and that further cuts would not be prudent. Uh, on the furniture budget, we believe that the furniture budget is adequate. Why do we believe that? Uh, between the budgets that you saw, we consulted with uh, experts who work with our architects on what the furniture needs would be. And we've come up with a plan that will allow us to reuse some of the furniture that is currently in, uh, that's currently in the library. Um, the library is a, a library which serves the town. 
So over time, I think this was Kathy's question, you can anticipate just the same way you can anticipate from the schools or DPW or anything else, that there will be requests to JCPC. And those requests will come in the, 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 the normal way. We hope, because we'll have a renovated and expanded library, that the scale and scope of those requests will be smaller than they will be if we do not repair, uh, if we do not renovate and expand. So we, we looked right from the beginning at the repair option. I know we're gonna talk about that in a minute. We thought what we could do about repairs would not be adequate to serve the needs of the library and the needs of the town. We looked at it at the beginning. We looked at it again when we got an estimate for the last town council uh, discussion. So I hope those are helpful in answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, did you have anything? Sure. So uh, in, in response to Dorothy's question about the capital projects, we have to do the four capital projects. That's not a should we or shouldn't we? We have to. And the library is one of them. We're going to have to make an investment into the library, either through the way we have planned it so far. And, you know, it has gone through every elected body in, in the town uh, town vote. Or it's going to need significant investment in repairs over the, in the near future. And um, so I think there is going to be, there has to be an investment in the library. And there has to be um, investments in both the fire and the DPW. The town has made some decisions that have delayed projects that have made them cost more. Um, COVID has impacted the cost of things. There's a lot of variables at play. Interest rates are an important variable as well. So all these variables are coming into play. And the as and we but the one thing we do know is that as we continue to wait, interest rates are going up. They aren't going down. We know that. But the inter, every every month. It's going to be more expensive, more expensive, whether we go the repair route or the um, the, the repair and the renovation and replacement route. Um, and I think we have, I, I think Austin said this, we have looked at the two options in the past several times and every time have come down to the conclusion that this is the best, best path forward given the amount of um, outside funding that is coming to this particular project. So um, so I think that it's not a question like, oh, does that mean we can't do blank? We are. We have to do them all. It just might mean a different shape or a longer period of time. Thanks, Paul, um, which gets me to the po uh, point I'm going to raise. We have three people who, uh, who have their hands up uh, for uh, counselors and so I'm going to ask a uh, question of the three of you and that is uh, the next thing that we wanted to do was to get the presentation of the updated repair estimates um, and uh, if uh, you're quite and it might be helpful for this conversation to get both presentations done so um, if you don't um, think that uh, if we if you can wait until after that presentation to ask the question um, that you're about to ask, lower your hand because I will recognize you if you don't lower your hand and otherwise we'll go on to that presentation. So Michelle. <laughs> Sorry to not be able to wait. Um, I this is a more general question and it isn't related to the repair. Um, and I think it's for Paul to two part question. Um, so the the first part is the MBLC requires a bond authorization for the full amount is how I'm understanding it. So they require us to authorize the 46 million. And I'm curious what the reason for that is. Um, and then the second part of that question is, if the library is unable to raise the necessary funds, do we have some legal obligation uh, to cover that shortfall? So I, I've been trying to take in as much information as possible. Um, and one of the pieces um, of information I received recently indicated that we would be on the hook uh, for, for that 
for that shortfall. And, and I, I think I've been vocal about my support for the expansion. Um, so this, this is the one uh, piece that gave me some pause. Um, if there is some legal obligation on our part to cover that shortfall, I, I do have concerns for how we would manage that. Go ahead, Paul. So yes, most capital projects require you to have the full appropriation before we go out to bid. So you have that you have the authorization from the council, whether it's a school building project or whatever, whichever project you have before we go out to bid, we like to we have to have the authority to be able to contract with the with the bidder who comes in, and that's also um, my understanding is an MBLC uh, requirement as well, and that's that's a typical um, condition for grants. And David may want to jump on this if if you if you want to on that piece, David. Sure. Was... I'm sorry. Go ahead, David. Uh, sure. Uh, yes, that it is very typical for. Uh, projects where the get where there is funding from other sources from the Commonwealth that the uh, requirement uh, by the state agency whether it's uh, MBLC yeah. or MSBA will require that the full amount uh, be authorized now the um, the question of how the town you know will assure that assure that uh, it ultimately doesn't finance more than the 15.8 that's covered by other uh, parts of the, uh, you know, of the financing plan, which other folks can talk to, but it is very usual to have the entire uh, amount authorized. And so I think we, I talked a little bit earlier, maybe I'm not sure if you were here, Michelle, about how, how we, our um, security blanket is the endowment and that's the agreement we have with the trustees. Um, and, and so I think that that and then that's and then it flips to the trustees. What is their protection? What is their role as the trustees of the library? But from the town's point of view, which is what my concern is, I feel pretty secure in the fact that um, yes, we are authorizing this these funds. Um, the we you know we're confident that the MBLC is going to fulfill its commitment. You know, barring them, it just like. We never know. Maybe they go out of business. Maybe they, who knows what. But I mean, we're pretty sure that and the MSBA for their part, they're going to fulfill their commitment. We're on the hook for those if they decide not to pay us. I mean, but that's unreal. I don't think that's realistic. Um, and then for the um, and for these tr the um, trustees portion, which is the other big portion, you know, we have secured an agreement with them about what they promise to do. And I think, you know, they are elected officials. They have they have a resource that most elected officials, which is an endowment that is able to secure this. And they've also proven recently at the ability to bring in significant commitments. I mean, they have an, a, a written commitment from Amherst College. I think they, Amherst College will not back off of that. So I think they have commitments from, you know, federal and and local so that gives me enough comfort and the fact that they've also backstopped that with their endowment um, i think we should feel pretty secure in this andy can i just ask one quick follow-up um sorry i'm just going to take it out just a bit further thank you paul that was really helpful um if for some reason the library was to default on that uh agreement that you spoke about um, would there be some recourse on the part of the town uh, to deal with that? And, and maybe that's, you know, a little far thinking. And I, and I don't expect that to be the case, but I'm just thinking about the, the legal um, yeah. responsibility. Yeah. So, so our attorneys looked at it and there are, there is recourse in there for us, the town to enforce the agreement. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and I see Bob Ham's hand up. So I run the Bob. Thank you. Um, I guess I would like to say a couple of things. One is that you know the trustees are elected townwide. We actually think of ourselves not just mm -hmm. as library, but also as town officials. Um, so it is not that we are thinking only about the library. Um, second is that um, it has been my hope and expectation uh, that the point at which we would be making our payment would be at the point where the, the MBLC had made its final payment, that we had had our opportunity to, to do the fundraising that we had anticipated, 
all of which meant that um, although this, I, I, I could only look at it on the screen, but it looked like you were looking for a payment in July of uh, 27, uh, and that that might work fine if the construction has been completed in, in July of 26. Um, but if that has not been true, then my understanding has been that what we're looking at is a payment which is essentially within one year after the CFO has been issued. And so I'm just trying to make sure that the timing on this makes sense from our perspective. Um, the second or third point, I guess, is that uh, we have until the project is approved at this point, whether it's next week or the following week or the third week after that, um, we have not tried to receive actual cash from a number of our uh, donors. Uh, and my anticipation would be that the flow of funds would in fact begin somewhat faster than this uh, cash flow projection. But it's also true that many of the people who have been providing it in institutions as well have said that they would do it over a period of time. So we might get 25% of it in year one and 25% in year two and so on. Um, so you know there is potentially a cash flow question um, that would has two implications. One is that a I think we will be providing money sooner in some ways than you are currently projecting. In which case, perhaps the bands would not have to be quite as large. Um, but b that there might be some uh, delay on, on the last payments, and I just need to worry about that because. Um, I don't believe that we are going to be in a position where we need to uh, get a loan of $8 million. I would find that horrendous, frankly. Uh, but I do believe that, that it, it is probable. I'm not sure I want to say probable, but, but I will say it anyway, probable that we will have to get a loan of some kind. Uh, but I'm certainly hoping that it will be a lot less than $8 million, and I would certainly hope that it would be something around or less than $4 million. Thank you. Austin? I, I, just, uh, I just wanted to respond to Council Miller. Um, your, your, your very good questions direct back to the original Memorandum of Understanding. There are two. And if you look at the Memorandum of Understanding, it is very clear what the library share is. And library share is anything above the town share. And the memorandum of understanding is an, so to speak, irrevocable commitment that we have to pay um, the town share. The memorandum of understanding, and Bob just referenced it, contains a due date provision. So again, you can look at that due date provision. It says the due date for our share is uh, 2026, or later if the MBLC comes in later, or as Bob said, uh, one year even beyond that. So it's very clear about what our obligation is. Um, it's very clear about what the remedies are, and it's very clear about when uh, we are expected to provide the uh, provide the funds. That's the first memorandum of understanding. The second mem memorandum of understanding will go to the conversation that we're going to have next, which is if the town council would decide not to go forward uh, with the barring the additional barring authorization. The second member of understanding commits the library to spend, I believe, $1.8 million to help fund the repair option. So if one is concerned, as one should be, about the impact of all of this on library operations, if uh, the town council does not go forward with the additional appropriation, uh, the library is still going to face an obligation of $1.8 million uh, to help fund the repairs that will need to be done. And we'll be again in the position of where does that money come from? So it, it's not a case where if you don't go forward with the barring up uh, authorization, there'll be no impact on the question of library operations. There will be. 
Thank you, Austin. So um, I'm going to turn to the next topic that we wanted to um, address. And Lynn, um, I don't know if you have the slide available if uh, it's needed. And I want to um, introduce uh, for those who uh, haven't met him, uh, Bob Perrin. You hear Bob? Yes, I'm here. So, Good afternoon. So I don't know who's going to do the major uh, presentation about this, but um, we wanted to get the subject of the repair options and the co the current cost analysis that you did and reviewed based uh, for the larger group. So do you so, want to take over? Let me just, so, so people know Bob Parent is our special pr capital projects um, person who who is coming in working on lots of projects engaged with the school building with the library building um long time town engineer uh, head of public works um worked for titan bond for a private engineering firm incredible professional engineer incredible experience so we've really appreciated his involvement in this because he really brings a keen eye to the work and so we had him look at the repair option and tell us what does that look like today and what in terms of how we can update that so that so you're looking at apples to apples when you are reviewing things so bob certainly thank you paul um what i did was i started with an estimate that coon riddle had put together in june of 2020 they had developed two options for repairing the library. Um, option number one had an estimate of $19.4 million. Uh, excuse me, option number one had an estimate of $21.7 million, and option number two had a, an estimate of $19.4 million. Uh, the two options were primarily split into three versus two phases. Option one had three phases to be completed over five years. Option two had two phases to be completed over three years. What I did was I started with the cost of those projects in June of 2020 dollars. And I escalated those costs to today, excuse me, actually to October, um, because that was when I did this. And using um, engineering news record building cost index data, which is a standard approach where you, they, they tabulate what building costs are on a month by month by month basis. And then you ratio what the current index is to what the index was at the point when the original construction cost was was developed. Um, that by itself resulted in a 28.7% increase from June of 2020 to October of 2023. What I then did was I then based uh, projections going forward on a construction start date of 2025 for either option. And as I indicated previously, one option was to be built out over five years, or the other option was to be built out over three years. I projected those numbers forward at 4% uh, with, the, with the hope that we're going to start to see inflation stabilizing. Those numbers could be higher. You know, we, we, we'll see where, where things go in the future, but you know, assuming we have a 4% average inflation rate, which is certainly higher than the CPI has been looking backwards, uh, that that may be a conservative look forward. One thing I did want to note, and I confirm with this with Elon Tierney at Kuhn Riddle, was when these estimates were developed back in 2020, they did not anticipate, because they had no ability to anticipate, that the statewide stretch energy code requirements that took effect this year, took effect in July of 2023, which our current project is based on, um, has been updated to include were not included in their estimates, nor were they able to benefit from the additional due diligence that we've done in terms of additional asbestos testing to confirm where we have asbestos, primarily it, beyond areas that we anticipated, but also in some of the ceilings and in some of the walls. Uh, that is one of the reasons why this project cost has increased as it has. Neither one of those were anticipated back in June of 2020. So the point to be made that the escalated numbers going forward, uh, based on my analysis, which are 21.7 million, excuse me, I, I misspoke just a moment ago. I apologize. I, I cited the, the going forward numbers when I mentioned cost estimates. The going forward numbers are 21.7 for 
for option one and 19.4 for option two, they are up from what had been 16 million and 14 million in 2020. Those numbers are do not include, again, the current stretch energy code um, changes that took effect in July of 2023 and are part of the current project, nor do they take in effect the um, the asbestos, um, additional asbestos costs that we've, we've discovered through the additional due diligence to make certain that we remove as much uncertainty as we can in the project going forward. So I, I think that's in a nutshell. Um, you can see what's on the screen right now is option number one, three phases, again, as I indicated, to be uh, constructed over five years. Two of the phases would re require relocation of, of the library. One of the phases would not. Uh, when the, the exterior improvements are underway, they at that point anticipated that the library could continue to be in function, but during the other two phases, it couldn't. Similar type of thing for option two. Uh, they anticipated that the second phase would not require a full closure of the library, but the first phase would, and therefore the relocation cost would have to be carried as well. I think now that I made a correction, I, I think that's, you know, that's what had been presented in Paul's memo on November 13th. And certainly if you have any questions, um, uh, to the extent that I can, um, I will try to answer them. Okay. Um, Kathy, you have questions about the repair estimate. So, um, we do that, and then I'm going to go to Pam because she had questions from before and now. So I want to get let Pam go then after you. Hey, uh, thank you, Bob. Um, as I read this, so I'm just confirming you used Coon Riddle, and just so you know, Coon Riddle for everything but ADA and design costs used Western Builders, which was done a couple years before that. So your uh, MEP uh, numbers and the elevator numbers and thing originally came, and then you just escalate them. You did you at all look at the HVAC system and say, suppose we don't want to replace HVAC with fossil fuels, we want to go a different route? Um, or did you just use because that wasn't asked of Western builders? Um, so that I'm assuming is not in this. Then the other question it this was asked um during this presentation by Kuhn Riddle on did we have to replace the south elevator um for ADA compliance and it's partially compliant you can go in and out of it and the answer was maybe not because it's in the historic part of the building but I think what you've done is just build up the existing numbers rather than use your building and construction hat to say, um, wait a minute, you know, can we rethink this or what goes into HVAC? Because we now all know a lot about the Jones building in terms of its wiring, its plumbing. I mean, there's been a whole lot more work done than when Western builders looked at this. So those are my questions on these numbers. You know, I don't doubt that the number is higher, but I just want to know what's whether any more work went into uh, thinking through what this would really look like. Uh, you are correct in, in terms of what I did. I started with the assumptions that had been made back in 2020 and, and projected them forward, you know, to your point of looking at other HVAC alternatives. Like, you know, certainly if if this project it had to go to repair, I would expect that that would be part of the work that would be done at that point. And I expect that would probably further add to at least the construction cost, but hopefully over, you know, lifespan of the building, perhaps reduce the life cycle costs. Um, but I would imagine going, you know, going with anything different than was assumed by Kuhn Riddle could actually increase the cost, not decrease it. I just wanted to make the point, I don't even know whether Kuhn Riddle made any assumptions. It was the one before that, because they really were asked to come in and do the ADA. So they took what was on a page MEP. They had to even look up what MEP went, but I figured that's where HVAC and wiring, that's all the internal systems as far as I could see. Um, that was handed to Kuhn Riddle to then build up to add ADA and design design fees to, to get this all done. Thank you. 
Uh, Pam, thank you for being so patient. Thank you. Thanks for the information. Um, back in the spring, a conversation between the town manager and the library director uh, was a conversation about bare minimum work. And I think for folks' benefit, it would be helpful to understand as a comparison, what was the what was the cost if if uh, Bob has actually looked at that? What is the cost of that bare minimum repair work that was that was discussed um, with HVAC and the roof? Um, if you were to pull that out only, and I understand this is not what anybody wants, but I think we we need to be able to understand what the the bare minimum uh, contribution from the town to the renovation of this building would be in comparison with the, the 19.4 or the 21.7? That is a good question that I wish I could answer. Unfortunately, yeah. um, as I stated previously, I started with the same assumptions that were made back in 2020 and then projected those forward. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, I th it I'm sorry, Pam. I, th I think Rob Morrow had worked on that, so I can try and find that information if we have that. I was going to ask if, if it's not available today, would that be possible to pull out as a separate item? I think we had talked about the HVAC was a high priority and the roof was a high priority, right? right. Those two projects. Right. Yeah. That would be very helpful. Thank you. And the, the other thing that uh, Bob and I talked about yesterday is, is that uh, when you start doing this, you trigger into the requirements of ADA accessibility, which is um, a substantial addition to cost. Uh, Sharon, is, do you have anything on this particular point? Yeah, I just wanted to quickly input. So HVAC roof and now the fire alert system. So that whole, the, the fire, uh, the sprinkler system, all of that needs to be replaced too. Um, which we, I mean, we knew it was, it was at the end of its life, but we're um, living on borrowed time now. Thank you. Mandy, thank you for your patience. Um, thank, thank you. Um, and I'm going to stick to some comments and questions uh, regarding this, this repair, which is said to be an option. I'm not so sure it is. Um, uh, so, so as um, it was said, I, I just want to make sure I understand that this does this. These costs don't include additional asbestos work that was not known at the time the original estimates were made, and therefore those would add to the repair costs um, of these numbers of nineteen to twenty-one million. Um, and and it was referenced that it doesn't include compliance with the new. Um, stretch code that went into effect this past June, whereas the current plan for renovation and expansion and the request to increase the borrowing does. But the count town council just passed a new bylaw um, implementing the specialized code as of June of next year. And looking at these numbers and the assumption as to when the project would start on this, I believe, and I just want to clarify that that means the repair numbers would actually need to be changed. And if we, if, if this was the um, default option because the town council does not vote to increase the borrowing, that these numbers would increase even more because it wouldn't be the stretch code that would need to be complied with, it would be the specialized code that would need to be complied with. Um, is that correct? Um, and is it, it, does that mean in my brief understanding of the specialized code as we were doing it, it means that if we were to put in a fossil fuel HVAC system, we would also have to pre-wire, I think, or would we have to pre-wire for a non-fossil fuel HVAC system? Um, or how would that work with a repair only HVAC system under the specialized code. Um, this project, if we did not put an electric HVAC system in, if we kept a fossil fuel gas fired HVAC system, that means we would not get any closer to meeting our climate action goals. Um, and if we wanted to, that means it would be higher than this 19 to 21 million. I'm just making sure I understand what this 19 to 21 million includes and what it doesn't. 
Um, and it also doesn't include any change of use or additional space usage. Um, it would keep the library use space usage exactly the same as it is now, which we've heard is not working um, or compatible with how the library needs to be used going forward. So I, I that that's sort of part of my question as to what doesn't this include that would need to be added in to better meet our climate action goals, to meet the required specialized code that we just adopted um, that would go into effect in June of 2023 and to address issues in building that we didn't know existed when these numbers were done. And then to address Pam Rooney's question about the bare minimum, that might be what we have to do in the next year and a half, but it's not like we're not going to have to do the rest of what's in this estimate. Uh, the longer we wait to, if we do not increase the bond, the longer we wait to address all of the deferred maintenance, the higher the cost will be, and it will not ever be cheaper than 19 million in this or 15.6 million in what the town share of the um, project as we are asked to be fully bond out is. Is that also correct? That it's not like HVAC fire suppression and roof is the only thing the library would come to us and request at JCPC in the next five to 10 years if we were, if we do not have bond out the additional 9 million for the renovation and expansion project. Thank you. I uh, see we have a member of the Finance Committee in, who hasn't had a chance to ask a question before. Alicia? Can I, excuse me, can I just follow up on, on that conversation based on the question that I had asked? Okay. Uh, Sorry, uh, Alicia, I just... if that's okay with you. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to cut off there. Um, I think I think the overlying overarching question there though is rather than getting into the details of of the the nuances and the cost escalations and the specific items that may or may not be included in those repair estimates, is what is the town obligated to cover in terms of basic repairs to the building? And I think that's what I'm asking for in terms of what is the bare minimum repair cost with the, with the several different items in comparison with whatever the projected fuller scope of repair or renovation might be. So let's, let's, let's talk about what is the town obligated to cover? Thank you. I'm waiting to see if anybody else, uh, you know, from the general principle that we have, the uh, repair of buildings, including the Jones Library, is, uh, goes through the JCPC process and is a town obligation. And uh, historically, that's what happened. And uh, what uh, the library uh, was very patient in not making requests for a number of years uh, in it because they were anticipating that they were going to make this proposal to do a major renovation and construction as a single piece. And they only asked for uh, JCPC allocations that would address specific and emergent problems um, and uh, said that because I was on JCPC at that point in time. Uh, and so I think that it still fall, is going to fall back to the town largely, uh, though there is a part of, as Austin said, the second MOU that the library did make some commitment. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else, if no one else has anything else they want to add to that, I'll go back to Alicia. Alicia? Um, yes, thank you. My question is kind of similar to Pam's, but I'm just wondering in terms of the 
um, repair option, would the town be responsible for covering the entire cost? I, you know, I, I can only say what I said before, that uh, historically we've taken on the responsibility of our uh, of doing the repairs on the Jones Library through the regular JCPC process. Um, and the only thing that's additional is uh, the second MOU. You know, Paul, is there anything that, or Lynn, do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think the I think the important point also is that the trust the director and the trustees did not bring forward capital projects over the last few years in anticipation, knowing that they're they weren't going to be making improvements to the fire alarm suppression system and things like that until we, um, you know, in anticipation of this construction going forward. So, I think we have to recognize that they they have a backlog um, and most likely if if we go the repair option, they're going to be coming forward with some significant repair option requests through JCPC. And of course, with Coon River. Um, thank you. If I might just, go ahead. sorry, Andy. No, go ahead. I'll stop. I just wanted to follow up because I, I think there might have been, I might not have been super clear in my question. I'm meaning more like, so there aren't opportunities for contributions from trustees via fundraising or donations or endowment or anything else if we switch to the repair option. Maybe I'll turn to Austin on that one. It was a good, thank you very much again, a, a very good question, a very helpful question. Um, we pledged $1.8 million towards the repair. Uh, that's what we've, uh, that's what we pledged. Uh, we, we did that again, considering the impact over what period of time on our operations. Uh, the town could come back to us and say, we want more from, from the library. At this point, there's no commitment from the library to add more, nor do I believe it would be appropriate to ask the library to commit more of its endowment or to go out and take a, a loan. Uh, the library is a town facility. And what Bob Pam said, I just want to reiterate, which is the library does have a source of funds. It has an endowment, but we have and would continue to work with the town uh, to be good stewards of this facility. The second thing is um, we do not know uh, what available sources of funds there are out there that might help us do an HVAC system or a roof. The experience so far in the fundraising, and Lee Edward is gonna to speak to that in a minute, <laughs> uh, su suggests that the enthusiasm that has been generated has been generated by the plan. And the plan is for a renovation and an addition. The third thing is, uh, we've asked the development committee of the Friends to do a particular thing, and they have now spent years doing it. And that is to go out and solicit funds, raise funds for repair and renovation, uh, excuse me, for renovation and expansion project. People are really enthusiastic about it because it does things like makes the building in much more environmentally sustainable than it um, has been. It offers facilities that are not now present in the library for a teen space and for English as a second language. It offers uh, what has been a priority of the town, space for the Civil War tablets and uh, what, what we call a humanity center, which is basically the space for the Civil War tablets, special collections, and the um, art gallery. So uh, I think what we know is that there's considerable enthusiasm for the plan that we have. Uh, I, I don't know that there's enthusiasm to contribute to uh, re repairs of the building. But again, Lee would be in a better position to actually um, answer that. Lee? I think my hand is up. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go. Thank you. Um, yes. Indeed, the Capital Campaign Committee has been very vigorously 
working to raise money for the project to renovate and expand the Jones Library. And we have succeeded remarkably uh, in raising funds for that project. In the unlikely, I hope, event that that project does not go through, all the funds that have been raised, including from the MBLC and from private donations and from the federal and state funds, they are not committed to anything other than this project. And I have to assume that they will go away. And many of them will definitely go away. So that's about $23 million by my account. Thank you, Lee. I'm going to um, recognize Anna and Bernie, and then uh, we did promise that we would take public comment at some point during the meeting, and I don't want to uh, back off on that because it is um, a policy of the council. Uh, and uh, then we had questions from uh, the council uh, that were presented to the forwarded to the library. And so we want to spend some time with that too. Um, and uh, I know, Lynn, if you think that that uh, is uh, a reasonable plan now for the next portions of the meeting. And yeah, the, uh, Paul, go ahead. I just want to note that um, I know uh, Bob Parent has to leave at three, and I'm assuming David Eisenthal, we had promised him a, a two hour window. So just out of, you just may see them disappear from the screen at some point, just so you know. Okay. Um, let me just say to the entire group, if anybody has questions, uh, either of them, uh, please ask, uh, get your hand up um, immediately uh, so that we know. Uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna see what uh, Anna, who hasn't spoken yet today. Uh, with, Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I think I, I just wanted to affirm what Austin and Lee were just saying, because I, that was why I had initially raised my hand was to make the comment to Alicia's point that folks have committed fundraising pledges and to a specific project and to spend it on something other than that project wouldn't be ethical, but the trustees can't do that. So um, those are significant donations. They come with MOUs, they come with agreements, right? They're not just, they're not, they're not, you know, well, some of them are, I guarantee are probably $25 checks, but some of them are a lot bigger. And um, that's not something that can simply just be reassigned at the will of the, the town or the trustees. And so that funders and goes away. And that's um, significant. All those, the, the grants were for a project, they go away, they have to start over. And so um, that for me is, is one of the really indicative, uh, indicative, one of the things that is very indicative of this project not being uh, able to be rethought in that way because of how um, how those things are not able to be reused, right? They're not able to be re those donations aren't able to be repurposed in that um, in that sense. So I wanted to thank Lee and Austin for stating that so succinctly. Good, thank you, Bernie. Yeah, and thank you, Andy. Um, I'm um, a little bit amazed because we we keep talking as if the library isn't an essential part of this town. It is. It's very much in the fabric of Amherst. It's very much in what we do. We're the town of the book and the plow, remember? So, um, you know, we, we really need to pay attention to what is a very valuable and literally central resource for the community. Uh, the library is a social resource. It's an educational resource. It's open to everyone and everybody. You don't have to have anything special. You just walk in and you, you're you accepted. It's an amazing service. Um, it's also a trip generator. It brings people into the town, brings people downtown where they stick around and shop and do other things. Um, I just noticed in terms of Paul's presentation the other night when we did the budget overview, that town support for the, the support for the library has gone from 3% of the town's budget to 2% of the town's budget. Um, I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, or, but it seems to be that that's a 
reduction by 33 percent. Uh, so we, we need to keep that in mind. We're, we also have to keep in mind that we're once again toying with turning down state money, uh, dissing our congressman who's gone out and uh, gotten extra money for us, um, ignoring the efforts of, of our state senator and state representative who managed to get extra money for us. Uh, and I also want to repeat um, a point that Andy made uh, very briefly is that um, if you if, if you repair the roof, uh, you're going to be ADA requirements. So there's no such thing as a minimum. You're going to have to do a lot of work, and then you're going to have to do some more work to, 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 uh, to finish off the repairs that are necessary for the building. Thanks. Yeah, I have one thing I want to say, Bernie, just because you make me defensive as the uh, one who always is looking over the budget for the uh, council and for the former form of government, we have had a continuous policy of increasing by equal percentages each year the um, major functional areas of town services, library, schools and regional schools, and uh, except for one year blips for uh, a couple for small amounts, we have stuck with that. Uh, the increase in other sections of the budget um, affects a little bit the percentage. So I think that uh, you have to be very careful how you phrase that point that you were making. Um, I think that we've, we've maintained the same commitment of uh, per equal percentage increase uh, uh, for a long period of time. Um, and we go to Michelle, and then I really do think that uh, we owe it to the public to uh, allow a little bit of public, uh, a little a period for public comment. And then I want to turn to the questions that counselors uh, forwarded to through Lynn to the uh, trustees and the library staff. So, Michelle? Yep. This will be brief. And um, I, I want to appreciate Bernie's comments, but I also want to say that you know, historically the library doesn't feel to everybody like a place they can walk in and be accepted. And I think that the library and the, the, the staff, the trustees, the folks who are fundraising, the people on the building committee, um, the task force that are associated with the building committee are all doing a lot of work to change that. And so I just really want to uplift that and acknowledge um, that it isn't, it hasn't always been that space. I get it. It's a public library. That's our intention. Um, but I, I want to acknowledge that it, it hasn't always been. And, and we're doing, um, I think, some good work to, to change that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So um, I'm going to take a couple minutes to uh, uh, see if there's anybody from the public who wishes to make comment. Um, and I'm going to ask that anybody who has an interest to please raise your hand now because I'm not going to expand the list. What I'm going to do is uh, the amount of time I'm giving, I want to give to people will depend upon the number of hands that go up. So um, I, I don't want to expand the, the listing uh, uh, as we go through public comment. Uh, so, uh, at this point, I'm giving it a moment because I don't want to cut it off too quickly. Uh, but if we're around the number that we're at, I think we can do three minutes. I don't know if uh, uh, we can have the timer available to us or uh, from Athena or not. Yes, I'm ready with that. Okay, so... Um, I think we've now had six people. So I'm going to assume that seven gets what it's like. Uh, okay, so I'm going to cut it off at Ken. Um, but uh, the first, uh, and I'm going to take it, just take it in order that they came in. So uh, Sarah Marshall then is the uh, should be brought into the room and uh, state your name and uh, uh, what district you live in so we have a rough idea and then 
please go. You have three minutes and uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sarah Marshall, Eames Avenue in District 4, speaking on, in support of the supplemental bond authorization. Your term on Amherst Second Town Council is nearly over. What will be your legacy? Council has moved our town forward over the past five years in many significant ways, including backing the Jones Library renovation and expansion project and the new elementary school. You are now asked to authorize, because state law requires it, the additional borrowing needed to allow the library project to proceed. That project was not only approved by council two and a half years ago, but approved decisively by voters. At this moment in time, you should not revert to square one and relitigate the pros and cons of the project. Rather, you should carry out the will of the voters unless there is significant downside to doing so. Some residents who have worked tirelessly to kill this project are now trying to persuade you that the remaining funding gap of about 15% of the project cost presents an intolerable risk to the town. I strongly disagree. I do not see the fundraising glass as half empty. Rather, I see it as impressively half full. It is extremely difficult to raise funds during times of uncertainty, such as we have been in recently, but you can make the difference. It will be town council's continued strong support for the project that will supercharge the private fundraising by throwing the weight of the town behind the library. I urge you to be the leaders we need at this moment. Do not be so focused on the potential risks that you cannot see the influence your yes vote will have on fundraising. Do, re do not reject the work of volunteers who have landed significant donations during an uncertain time. Do not reject the work and support of our state delegation, Representative Dom and Sen Senator Comerford, and our representative in Congress, Jim McGovern, who have obtained an increased commitment from MBLC and federal funding. Do not cement Amherst's reputation as the city that can't say yes by rejecting another multi-million dollar state grant along with millions of dollars in privately raised funds. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. Please leave a legacy of two significant public infrastructure projects. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and Jeff Lee is gonna be next. And um, Amber, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to get to you because you had raised your hand later. I actually, for everybody present, I'll, I'll wait and see what happens. But um, the uh, council has a forum scheduled for Monday uh, uh, that is going to also be another opportunity for public input on this. And uh, so uh, I want to encourage uh, anybody who uh, would like to make further comment, also recognize that there is that forum and participate in it, but the, uh, it's uh, part of the council meeting and I think it's scheduled for 6.30 in combination with the general budget, if I'm correct. Uh, the it's general... actually scheduled for seven. Seven, okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff, have you, did you bring Jeff Lee in? Am I in? Yes, thank you, yep. Jeff. Hi, Jeff Lee, District 5. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Andy, I know in the past you've recused yourself from library deliberations on the Finance Committee, and you've acknowledged that you have a family member who works at the library. I wondered if that is still the case and if you intend to once again rec recuse yourself on this issue. Um, also wanted to talk about the repairs that are being presented as the option to, uh, or the alternative to not going through the supplemental bond authorization. I think it's wrong to imply that the town has to pick up the entire cost for that. And in fact, that it's entirely repairs. If you look at the uh, Hugh Riddle document, there are six sections of what needs to be done. Four of them are called improvements, not repairs. Uh, 
tune rule is clear that much of the cost comes from triggering a requirement to bring everything up to uh, building codes for accessibility, which is a worthy goal. But there are um, variances for historic buildings. And if you don't, if the work being done is less than 30% of the appraised value of the building, you don't aren't required to do it. So I think if we went to a smaller uh, repair, uh, repair option, we could do it for much uh, less money, especially the one that was described as plan B, which was the HVAC system and the roof. Um, and how can we say that the library will pay for half of the uh, renovation expansion, but only 1.8 million towards repairs? That doesn't make sense to me. And I think you're being pretty generous with taxpayer money to, uh, to claim that. Um, and lastly, uh, I know people who want the project to go forward are, will be quick to say that we lose all the raised funds if we um, don't do the full expansion, but I would like that confirmed. Uh, it seems like the prudent thing to do. Can we build a humanity center without expanding the building and get the $1 million grant we got from the federal government? I think they all need to be checked and you no. all Excuse me. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask that uh, I think Maria Kopecki is next. Thank you. This is a finance committee meeting to discuss the $46 million project. So I think that we should be talking about that. Um, the fact that the documents that were some that talked about in the beginning were not provided to the finance committee, the town council, the public prior to 20 ah. minutes before, excuse me, can, um, whoever that ah. is, me, I'm gonna. I'm gonna want my three minutes. Could that person please mute? Lee, Lee, Lee you need to mute. Lee Edwards, mute, please. Oh, <laughs> amazing! Because I thought mute. Please. I could not. No. Let me assure you. Wait, wait, Lee. Uh, not, hmm. Lee, Lee, stop. We do not respond during public comment. Oh, that's my right. comment. I'm sorry. So please, uh, That's just right, that I will, I, and, um, right. No, I'm sorry. That my apologies. I'm going away. And we'll I'm going away. Maria, go ahead, please. I'm sorry. Thanks, Andy. Um, I think that it's it's really indicative of the problems of this process that those documents were not made available, so that the finance committee could vet them, can dis could understand them, and can talk about them here in committee, which is what you're supposed to be doing. I was pleased to hear Bob ask to understand the impact on other capital projects. And it's not just the quote for capital projects, it's all the annual expenses. And I do appreciate that some other counselors tried to get to that. I was very concerned, um, but not surprised to hear that uh, some members of the library trustees felt that the quote, other needs of the town are outside the consideration of this project. That um, that may be true for library trustees, but the town councilors are here to ensure the health of the entire town. And that includes what will be the impact, which was not provided in the documents to the annual capital budget as over these next five years, when these very large $30 million of short-term loans are going to be having an impact and the interest on that. Um, if you look at, I mean, what I could briefly see from the cash flow analysis is that we're going to be paying contractors almost $3 million a month. So when we sign a contract, the contractors are not, don't want to hear about promises and information deficits and hope that Austin Surratt was talking about. When you sign a contract, they're going to want to be paid 
for the labor that they're doing and for the materials that they're using. And they're going to want to be paid as they should as that is happening. And as was finally admitted in this meeting, that's going to be on the town. The town is paying that. The town is paying the interest on that. And that is unless and until, or maybe until and unless, that $7.5 million that is still outstanding actually materializes after occupancy, after this decision is made. And this is all built on the house of cards that says that this project is going to cost $46 million. And I don't believe that you have received, I don't, haven't seen it publicly, the actual detailed cost estimates that would give some more inclination about whether that is a reasonable statement, not to mention looking at other projects that have gone over budget. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Judy Perkins. Thanks. Andy, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rudy Perkins, uh, Cherry Lane Amherst. Um, I sent the town council a letter when you were debating this in 2021. And I observed based on the numbers we saw then on capital projects that we had already jeopardized our progressive climate commitments for later buildings by severe caps on those capital budgets. Um, I hope that's going to be defended that those won't that those won't be impaired by what we do borrowing for the library. Um, I thought at the time the the scope of the project and the budgeting process were were flawed, but here we are. So I'm not going to relitigate all that. I would like to suggest some things that the finance committee and the town council can do in a new amendment to the memorandum of agreement that would address some of the questions I thought, thought were implied in some of the comments earlier. First is the money from the library has to come in earlier in the construction cycle so that we're not borrowing so much um, and sort of under the table subsidizing the library project further. Um, and so that that should be adjusted in the, in fact, I think the, the amendment actually made it worse because it redefined um, how much of the library share was due on the library share date, if I read it right, I'm making it all due at the library share date. That's, that's a mistake. Um, we should have it come in earlier. We should have the library responsible for any interest payments that we have to make because of interim borrowing to wait for their contribution um, coming in. And um, we should make sure that their share is defined not by a dollar figure, but by their obligation to pay for all of the total project costs that are in excess of the MBLC share and the town share as stated. That's not very clear in the memorandum of agreement. It should be made expressly clear so that no one has a misunderstanding that the town's supposed to pick up the tab if costs keep going up. So those things would help uh, reassure that the deal is as people understood it uh, previously and as it's being presented now. And that should be defined in a, a further amendment to the memorandum of agreement. We all really love the, the libraries in our town. Um, the Jones is a little different though, because it's because it's owned by a different entity. It has its own endowment. It's only committing to 30 years of public use at, at a minimum in the MOU. And it was exempted from our net zero bylaw because it was owned by another entity. So as much as I, I'm, from a big family of librarians going way back. I love libraries. I really support our libraries. I'm glad we're kicking in the 15 million. Um, and I'm not gonna recommend one way or the other on your vote on this, but I hope you will take this opportunity to tighten up that MOU, MOA, and make sure that the commitments are clear and the obligations understood and that they reduce yeah, the cost of the to town. Finish up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Myra Ross. Do you hear me? Yes, I can, Myra. Okay. Um, it'll be very brief. I'd like to agree with Sarah Marshall. I'd like to also say that Bernie raised some very good questions um, and made a very good point, actually, which is, um, and it's what propelled me to try to raise my hand earlier. I speak as the chair of the Disability Access Advisory Committee. ADA improvements are not an afterthought. ADA improvements are part of what has to be done, just like a roof. You can say, oh, well, we could get out of it because of the historical commission. That's not the way to go. People don't think about AD improvements until they need them. And then when you need them, you say, oh my God, why can't I access this? Why can't I get in? Why can't I find a way to be a part of this? Um, for me, it has to do with web access more than getting in. But when you make a website, you are supposed to make it accessible from the get-go, not as an afterthought. And everyone thinks about accessibility as an afterthought until it's, it's something that they need. And then they wish somebody hadn't thought about it as an afterthought. So 30%, you can get under it, whatever it is. Um, that's not the way to think about this. And I really urge the town to do it right. I think that the points made by the previous speaker about making sure that the funding sources are crystal clear and the funding obligations are crystal clear is a good point. But I, I would hate to see you go to uh, a, a, rent, a repair uh, scenario because that's not going to achieve anything except spend a lot of money. That's it. Thank you, Myra. And Ken? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to begin by thanking all of you for working so hard on this project. I know it's not easy, and especially when you have to deal with characters like me who raise questions and uh, objections um, in Amherst. I, I want to begin by saying we're not, those of us like me who think this project is not going to be able to go forward as designed, are not trying to torpedo the library. We're trying to find a library that we can all afford and love and use, and that will work for the citizens of Amherst. So please understand my questions are raised in that, in that spirit. I'd like to ask about the interest rate that's assumed in the uh, interest number that President Kriesmer read of $7,944,000. Uh, call that $8 million. Um, I, I wasn't able to see on that paper what the interest rate was, but I've heard the use of the word of the interest rate 4% for the bands. And if that 4% has been used to calculate the uh, long-term debt, then I think it may be a little understated because from what I can find online, other towns in Massachusetts recently have had to pay as much as four and a half or 5%. And if those numbers are used, then that's an additional one or $2 million in interest. I don't think it's gonna be that high, but I'd like to know what interest rates you were using. I also would like to see if by Monday, you could ask somebody to give you estimates about the asbestos and the uh, meeting the stretch energy costs because we keep hearing about those as not being um, budgeted or, or, or not being projected, but they would be actual costs if we had to have them. And I'd like to know that so we can know what a total repair cost would be. And finally, I would like to say donors to this library may be donating, donating specifically to a particular project. And that might be true with some of the grants, but some of the private donors are donating to a library they believe in and they want to support. They're not donating to a, just a project. So if if this project doesn't go through as presently designed, and if you have to go back to see to, to the donors who have committed so far or pledged so far, I think you would find that they would be contributing. And at, at, at the risk, uh, President Serrett, of putting you in an awkward position, let me say, I suspect that if, if you had to go back to uh, Amherst College and say, we're not going forward as planned, but we're going to have a wonderful repair project for you, that you would simply walk across the hall to President Michael Elliott and say, Mr. President, could you please be sure that that million dollars is still available for the library? Honestly, Amherst College is not committing to a project. It's committing to the town of Amherst through the library 
and that million dollars would be there, and so would hundreds of thousands of others' money. I'll have more to say on Monday, and thank you very much for this opportunity today. Thank you. Um, with that, I had said at the beginning that people needed to raise their hands um, when so that I, we parsed out the time, we would know um, how many people were asking to be recognized. And I apologize that we've had to do that in order to control the meeting, because I know that there's a couple of people who raised their hands since then. But um, to just keep adding on and um, invites that, and then it becomes impossible to enforce. But I also want to again repeat that um, this is not the last uh, the most important public comment period that we do have a budget forum scheduled and the forum on this particular topic at the Monday night council meeting. And um, it's uh, the, the forum is scheduled, uh, I was corrected, it is 7 p.m. and it is uh, uh, a part of the council meeting and uh, with the budget forum, it's a very kind of different uh, format than we do for public comment. Um, and so I don't know, Lynn, if you wanna say anything else about the plans for Monday, but, uh, Lynn, you do have to. Uh, thank you. A couple things. Um, there is a detailed cost comparison in the packet. Uh, and there is also a, a discussion uh, about the contingency, which is $3 million in the memo from the town manager. Um, this has been a very informative discussion from my perspective, but I do want to mention that on Monday night, the town council will actually uh, uh, convene at five o'clock. However, we will be reading the town manager evaluations that each of us have written and hopefully a draft evaluation that I have written. Um, at 6.30, we begin the forum um, for the budget for next year. And at seven o'clock, we begin the public forum for the um, financial orders that the town manager gave us last week, which the town count, the finance committee have voted on to recommend to the council. And we also have a public forum and that in that same public forum, we will also deal with the library. We will not be taking a vote on the library on Monday. The earliest we will be taking a vote on the library is the 4th of December. So this is not the last opportunity. I also wanna encourage anybody else who has questions or suggestions, uh, like we received, for example, from um, Rudy Perkins about the MOU. Um, please make sure you send that to the town council uh, and we will do everything we can to address those. I have other comments, but I'm going to stop with that. Paul. Would, Andy, would it be permissible for me to ask David Eisenthal before he has to get off to um, address what, what kind of assumptions he built into his percentage, his interest rates? Certainly. David. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Paul. Uh, on the Long-term bond issue, we I assumed a four and a quarter percent rate, which I think is consistent with the twenty-year um, term that uh, we we were talking about here. Uh, we had looked at actually four and a half percent for a thirty-year term, so we are you know it really is based on the term, and I think that that's consistent with what we're seeing uh, in the current marketplace. Thank you. Um, there were a series of questions that were posed, and the reason we wanted to uh, make sure we had time to complete our agenda for today for this topic, there were a series of questions that were presented um, there, I believe, in the packet uh, for the meeting, uh, questions from counselors regarding the library renovations and additions. I don't know, I'm sure that they're there. Uh, 
but uh, I can check that. Uh, in any event, uh, I think we should uh, spend a few minutes uh, because they we don't have responses to all of them. I think there was only a response to the very first question. And uh, but uh, the first question is when will Jones come back to the council? for a decision on whether or not to move forward, including documentation on the financing plan and will keep the town taxpayer share of $15.8 million of the precise amount. And I, that was responded to, and that's been the subject of uh, a lot of the discussion today. Um, Okay, I see that there is some more information. Lynn, do you want, uh, since you've been the keeper of this, do you want to take over for a few minutes? Yeah, but this is also answers that came from the trustees. So uh, on the very first one, as Andy has mentioned, um, this we will come back to the council at the earliest on the 4th of December, and it does require a two thirds vote of the council, regardless of how many councilors are present. So it's nine councilors must vote for the project. Uh, the latest cost estimates, the one that is being, we are dealing with is this one. This was the other cost estimate that came in, but when reconciled, it ended up being this one. Um, I'm gonna ask Sharon to jump in on number three which we all partially addressed before. Is there anything else to add to that? No, I don't think so. Okay. The next question was regarding the book sorter and Sharon, uh, any further comments on this? No, I just want to highlight my conversation with the, you know, Greenfield Public Library director. Um, the the book sorter is very much a part of our, it's it's an integral part of our service model. Um, our usage is going to skyrocket in a very good way. And what we want is for staff to be on the front lines um, doing what they do best, which is, you know, per, uh, serve the public, the, the customer service aspect. The technology is, is meant to just check books in. Um, and does it's a, it's coming in at a cost of two hundred and thirty thousand because it's on the state bid list. So it's just it's it's a really important piece of this uh, project. And you have a comment here about talking with Forbes. Uh, I so I haven't spoken with Forbes, but I invite any of you to go and chat with Lisa. I I would think that if she were going through a building project, uh, she would switch over to uh, RFID in a heartbeat. Okay. The next question was really dealing with what happens to the operational plans when the Jones is closed. And Sharon, I'm gonna go back, come back to you. Sure, um, so we don't know yet. And so much of it depends on how much square footage we're gonna have and the location and it, will it be in more than one building? Um, but staff are ready to make those decisions based on whatever site is chosen. And um, no one knows better than the staff what the needs of the patrons are. And they will uh, absolutely, you know, we've we've discussed with the town manager that we would love a central location for, uh, you know, pickup of holds, uh, as well as ESL. That's an important piece. Um, a lot of a lot of those users take the bus. And, and so um, not having to transfer bus lines is really important um so yeah it's uh to be determined okay let me i'm gonna go through all the questions and then come back okay um sharon uh can you talk about where you are in seeking a temporary home and what you anticipate for cost and location uh, we, we, uh, Bob Parent and I were just working with Simone on this. We did just have to reject the, um, the bids that came in because there, uh, wasn't enough square footage being offered. So, uh, Simone will put out a new RFP possibly after Thanksgiving, I think, and, and responses will be due some, sometime end of January, beginning of February, um, and so, yeah, that's all I can say about that. Okay. Um, number seven, Bob, Pam, you really are the one that deals with the current endowment. 
I can't see who else is. Um, well, the, the answer is correct. It is 4% draw rate. Um, for this year, it was 351,501. Uh, <clears throat> that is the highest it's been in a while. It's generally been between 300 and, and 320, 330. Um, those have been adequate to service the, the needs of the library. Uh, I can't tell you what it will be in the immediate future, um, but, you know, for next year, it is going to include, you know, a very good year when, when it had reached $10 million. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, you know, in future years, it will always be up. So that is where we are. Thank uh, you. Lynn, Lynn, Lynn I yes. just want to add the draw rate is set by a policy of the board. If yeah. the board found that we needed more money from the endowment, we could raise the draw rate at colleges they go as high as five or sometimes six percent on a draw on their endowment so just uh, we all ought to remember this is a uh, set by a policy of the board uh, over several years with the good stewardship of our trustees and our treasurer we've we've lowered the draw rate so as to preserve the value of the endowment but but that's a variable figure it can be changed as needed thank you both for that more thorough answer um number eight Sharon, I believe this is you again. Yeah, so we have already in our, our budget for this fiscal year, um, we have money to hire another uh, custodian um, to you know handle the increased uh, usage. Um, and because of the automated materials handling system, uh, we're not planning on any additional staff. Okay. Uh, number nine is really... Uh, I believe either Kent Farber or Jenny Hamilton. Do either one of them, I don't, are either of them in the room? Lynn, this question, Lee Edwards answered this question. Okay. So, Lee, it's our, go ahead, Austin, please. This question has been answered um, on the basis of what we know uh, the funds that we have available are not transferable to a repair um, option. And, uh, you know, I can walk across the hall and pitch the president of the college on um, repair, but I'm going to say just repeat what Lee Edwards said. And that is, you all know this, if you've done fundraising, people contribute funds to a project. It's different from annual funds. Annual funds, I, th I think, right, people contribute because they love the library. So I, th I think what Lee Edwards said is the, is, is the right answer, which is if we say no to this, uh, millions of dollars go away. What is the plan if we cannot go forward? And this is the renovation question that I think we spent a lot of time on. So I'm not sure that we need to spend any more time on that. Um, the cost to repair, we've had quite a discussion about that, including what that cost estimate does not include. And then we get to the timing on the library and that is before you and I, uh, if there are other people from associated with the building project that would like to answer this, please jump in. Yeah, so the plan is to uh, go out to bid in January. Um, in March, we would sign a contract with a general contractor. Uh, and what Paul has said is that as of June 30th of 2024, that's when the North Common is going to be complete. Um, construction will go from April of 24 to November, December of, of 25 ish and then a grand reopening in December of 25. This is the whole issue of the financial risk and it's a combination of issues related to fundraising, confidence that the town will fund this, which then uh, actually convinces bidders, responsible bidders to bid and also the issue um, of how to deal with slightly higher budgets. 
Is there any, Austin, would you or anyone else want to speak to this? One other thing that I'd like to add is the fact that, so a vote now will allow donors to donate cap to the capital campaign at, you know, in this in this calendar year, which is really important. Otherwise, they're prob they'll probably wait until December of, of next year. Um, it, this is this is an important question. Um, we do have a strict deadline with the MBLC to sign a contract with a general contractor by June of next year. Um, and I'm we are all very worried that if we put off a town council vote till January or February, um, it, it will risk that piece. Uh, we also need time uh, to outfit the swing space and you know move into it. So those are all the reasons along with um, having the money in place uh, for bidders. Thank you. And then um, this was a piece of information that was provided in the packet on Monday. And then the issue of the money being turned over to the town. And so the goal is um, the minute we get it, we, we will turn it over to the town. Uh, the reason we haven't been doing that now is because um, we know we need another town council vote. And honestly, the logistics of sending it over to the town and then the town giving it back to us and then us, you know, cutting checks for all, all of these donors is a bit of a logistical nightmare. So I have a feeling the town's accounting department is happy that we have not given the money yet, not until we know that the, the project is in place. Um, may um, I just say, Lynn, again, this it's really important to be clear about this. What the What our capital campaign folks have been doing is they've been asking people to, to pledge and they've been asking people to pledge because if the project doesn't go forward, it eliminates uh, returning money to, to uh, folks. And the longer that we uh, continue with the uncertainty, uh, the longer it's going to be before the town actually gets money from the library. So having a, having a, you know, a decision now to raise the bond, uh, authorization is going to be important in being able to say to people, we now know this project is going forward. Turn your pro turn your pledges into contributions. And as Sharon said, we turn those pledges over to the town. One other thing, this issue of fundraising expenses has been raised. Uh, every capital campaign should be run as efficiently and with as low a overhead as this one um, has been. Uh, if you go and you talk to the to the fundraisers at Amherst or at UMass, you find that what they'll tell you is that the fundraising expenses are usually in the neighborhood of 7% or 8%. Uh, our fundraising expenses are de minimis in comparison with what they are for other capital campaigns. Thank you for that. Lee, you have your hand up. Well, yeah. No. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I want to reiterate what Austin has said and also the funds that the Capital Campaign Committee has raised are not fungible. They will not be turned over for any repair activities of and that's about by my count 23 million dollars so thank you thank you uh this was it's more work our question regarding the federal grants and when do we receive them one of the things that I wanted to say, in addition to what's in front of you, you know, every grant is different. And um, so the Jones Library Inc. had to apply for these grants. So the money has to come to the library. It can't go to the town. Um, and honestly, uh, uh, the town accounting department is lucky that it doesn't have to go through them because these are very complicated um, grants to uh, to oversee. Um, so it's because we are our, also our own 501c3 that we were able to um, apply for these. And so here's the list about, you know, when the money will come in. 
Thank you. Um, library endowment, here's information on it. We discussed it earlier, but here's more detail. And then we have further questions about the FF and E and um, the assurance that it's all in the budget. Here's some pictures of what the building looks like now, as the public can see if they're in the library. And here's information we shared with you earlier about uh, option one and two. And this is in the packet. Mm -hmm. So are there questions about this? Uh, opening it up to the back to the committee and the council if there are additional questions. And if not, then we'll close out this portion of the finance committee meeting and stay for a couple of minutes as a finance committee to just uh, make sure that we are planning for going forward. Kathy, though. Um, this is not so much a question as a comment. I shared this with Paul. I noticed that Greenfield, um, when it closed their library to build a new one, they got some kind of dispensation that they could do a lot of the services online. So it was a question if you run into, you mm -hmm. can't find the ideal space, um, can you still move forward? So it was just, a, and Paul said, People knew that already, but I just wanted to bring that up. That it's to me, it 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 allows, it allows you a little wiggle room. Yay! Play mute, please. Yay. Lee, 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 Lee Edwards, please Lee. mute Lee. Uh -huh. Yes, just a, a quick comment. Um, if you add up all of the money that the library has committed to raise, it has been of the order of 15 to $17 million. That is not something that one can easily say, why don't you just add another million dollars here or another half million dollars there? That is, that is not asking something that is reasonable. So I just want to, to be clear that although there may still be a gap of seven and a half, eight, eight and a half, whatever that number will turn out to be. Um, it is not something that one can continually say, why don't you just add a few more dollars? Because it's it's a lot of money. And I don't know that there are very many public projects of this kind, which have had that kind of contribution from local citizens, as well as um, state and federal grants that have been given at the request of the fundraising committee. Thank you. Andy. Hey, um, I don't see any yet. Well, I don't see any other hands from counselors or any, Lynn, your hand is up. So is it yeah, I want to make sure that if there are any counselors who have additional questions or information they would like that they tell us now, or they contact us within the next day or two so that we can try our best to get it and also recognize that there are some things we just not may not be able to get. Pam? Thank you. I would like to ask for uh, a, a snapshot of the um, capital plan, the five-year capital plan with the interest that we're talking about um, in the right year and in the in the correct amount so that we actually see the ramifications of any of the borrowing uh, against our capital plan. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask Paul if that is feasible. I believe so. Thank you. Okay, Pam, is there anything else? Okay, so um, I think that we can close out this portion of the meeting and uh, 
then just stay with for the anybody's welcome to stay for the rest of the finance committee meeting though I'd probably uh you would want to move to the audience and I don't we're not going to be meeting for very long and uh it's just generally to uh, make sure we're together on process more than anything else given uh, uh that this has been a pretty exhausting meeting but I really want to thank the trustees for having been here and the in the information that you provided uh, and uh, it's been very helpful to help as a finance committee and the council to understand what the request is and to process the information. So a big, big thank you to our friends on the trustees and the library staff and I want to uh, uh, thank the everybody else who participated in the presentation, even though I think that our two consultants uh, are gone now, but uh, Paul, please convey to them our appreciation. And uh, with that, um, I, don't, uh, I don't know if you want to adjourn your meeting. Yeah, Andy, if it would be okay with you, I'd like to adjourn the meeting of the Jones Library Board of Trustees. And again, thank you. Thank you very much to the counselors and the members of the Finance Committee. Thank you. And Lynn, I don't know, uh, we still have, uh, we're going to adjourn the council meeting, then uh, have to uh, move other counselors uh, into the audience. I'm At this point, I'm going to adjourn the full council meeting, but not the finance committee. Thank you. At 8.20, yeah. at eight I mean, at 3.28. Okay, thank you. So uh, to be really quick about things, uh, one thing, because I see that Mandy is still here, uh, the, uh, we, we had originally had the funding schedule for the uh, rental registration bylaw on the agenda today. Um, I think that we uh, concluded that um, it was it's a big topic to get in this late. Kathy has done some um, thoughts about some beyond thoughts, actually significant analysis. Um, and without getting into the detail, she might tell us about uh, just generally what the topic, what she did, but. Um, they, it's not something that I think we're in a position to talk about today, and we're going to have to factor that into our planning for our next meeting uh, to really come back to the discussion because of the uncertainty about today. Rob Mora is not present, uh, and uh, it really limits our ability to have that conversation anyway, even if there was uh, energy and willingness to put the time in at this point. Um, but uh, I don't know if um, the, I, what Lynn had said at the beginning of the meeting, I will repeat, which is that there's nothing to um, do we get in the way of if, if there's a first reading of the uh, proposed bylaw, um, it's not contingent upon uh, the uh, fee schedule. Uh, I don't know if uh, Mandy, if you have any comments about that, or if you want me to just go ahead and uh, let Kathy describe what she was, what she sent to you earlier, and sent to several others of us. You can let Kathy go. Okay, Kathy. Yeah, I'm. I don't want to take time. Um, I sent it. It's what we agreed to when we met. When did we meet on Tuesday, <laughs> that um, I had played with played. I looked at the ski fee schedule a bit and tried different a different fee for permit and a different fee for inspection. I also took a look at the bylaw regulations for the frequency of inspections, and I was working off the KP law version. And I was just focused on how often and how many. So I had some changes that would uh, potentially lower the inspection cost number. So I was in the fees, I was trying to get to the same revenues that we needed to cover it. So I sent them to Mandy and Andy very late 
the, today. And I thought it probably needs to be discussed at CRC so people can say you're crazy or that's a viable option. And I didn't send it to anyone else on the committee other than Athena, I think, just to, a record. So I did I did a spreadsheet. I used the spreadsheet to calculate, um, to do a calculation and did a memo on what the changes were. And that's it, Andy, because I think without getting into the detail of what I look like, people can't respond and we don't have time for that. So I'd rather work first with Mandy and people have been looking at this a lot um, and uh, I'll end. <laughs> okay, so um, I was just trying to figure out one additional thing and that is whether uh, it should go in the packet for today's meeting or whether you would prefer to talk to Mandy and then uh, make the decision as to whether you want to share it with the committee and put it in the packet then. Well, as far as I'm concerned, since we're not talking about it today, it doesn't need to be in today's packet, but I would like to be able to, I, I don't have a way to share it with other committee members without violating that we should only do it in a public meeting. So uh, Mandy can weigh in on this. Um, okay, Mandy. So it might be wise with Kathy having just summarized it to put it in today's finance committee packet and town council packet um, simply because um, as Andy indicated, I believe this the regulations and bylaws will be on Monday's council agenda for a first mm -hmm. reading. Um, and I haven't, I, I all honesty, I haven't looked at what Kathy sent me yet, but she sent some marked up versions of a of a regulations, I believe, um, and they're on for a first reading on Monday because GOL in on Wednesday voted clear, consistent, and actionable a revised version of the regulations and bylaws based on the KP law opinion, um, having revised it for clarity, consistency, and actionability. Um, so that would, if it goes in today's packet, that would allow it to potentially go in Monday's packet for the council if the president deemed so. And like I said, I haven't looked at it so that other counselors could see what Kathy might be bringing up as potential discussion and requests for revision after the first reading or at the first reading. That that works for me. And Mandy, I didn't actually redline it. I put a comment bubble because I was working off KP Law. So it's two specific places. And if Lynn's okay with that, that's fine with me. So that's just focused on the wording of the regulation, not not the fee schedule, but I can put my memo, the reason I question the wording and the fee schedule in today's finance packet. And then Lynn, you can decide which pieces belong in the council packet. Okay. Okay. Yep. And um, my question I was going to ask Rob Mora and Mandy might have access to the information already. Uh, was simply that I don't think that the committee, that our committee has ever been told what the current fees are, uh, are reminded of what the current fees are. And uh, that would, I think that that would be helpful to, to know in full for both. Uh, so Mandy, I don't know if you... Um, give, give me a second so I can look up that document, but... um. No, it, it is $250 per permit, so per parcel, for all non-owner occupied um, dwellings, uh, non-owner occupied rental parcels. Um, this is what the council voted a year and a two years ago, maybe. Um, so owner occupied permits for owner occupied dwelling rentals with owner occupancy involved up to six rental units um is i believe a hundred dollars 250 for all other rentals but it's on a per parcel basis not a per unit basis um and a inspection fee of 150 dollars um and since the current bylaw does not require well since Within the current bylaw, inspections only occur upon complaint, not um, there. That that fee is only charged if there is a complaint. Um, and Rob, I believe, has talked about whether they actually do that or not, but it is allowable to be charged. Um, but because there are no town inspections other than after complaints are received, I'm not sure there's been a lot of collection of 
inspection fees. I, I don't know the answer to that, but there is an inspection fee of $150 right now. So thank you, Mandy. So uh, the reason I wanted to bring that up was that uh, if any members of the committee want to take the spreadsheet, which we all have or have access to in the Excel version and uh, sort of work with it a little bit to understand it better, um, it's uh, helpful to know the, what the comparison is. Uh, we've had several comments from one resident member who uh, is uh, not happy with the $250 number, uh, but we should re remember the $250 is what the current fee is. So uh, just to bear that in mind, uh, when you uh, work with the spreadsheet, uh, the one big factor is, is that inspections on a routine basis are uh, assumed on a five-year schedule because uh, once there's uh, there, there's an inspection, if there are no problems and that are, are, can be resolved uh, promptly, um, then there's no inspection again for a five-year period. So that uh, when you work with it and you increase the um, inspection fees, it actually um, has a very different effect on the bottom line total than when you increase the uh, registration fee. And uh, so uh, I'm sure that that was that's a challenge to just have to work with if you're going to as you work with that spreadsheet. I don't know if there are any other questions that people have of Mandy or generally Bernie. Uh, just a reminder, um, for whatever reason, SharePoint doesn't like me, doesn't want to share, doesn't play nice. So if it's by going in the packet, you mean SharePoint, I haven't seen it. And I haven't gotten a copy yet, so I don't have access to the spreadsheet. I don't think I need it. I'm not going to um, take take the time to, to do what ifs on the spreadsheet. But if uh, anything that Kathy has generated for future discussions, um, Athena is usually very good about getting stuff to me, but um, you can just, if you're going to put it in, in a SharePoint packet, then just email me separately. Thanks. Okay. And uh, I think that the spreadsheet, I did email, if you'd like the spreadsheet, I'll email it again. I'll, I'll check it. I'll check again, Andy. I don't, I don't intend to, uh, do what ifs on the uh, on the schedule. Okay. The schedule. So, is there anything else that anybody wants to say? Because I promised this is going to be about scheduling and process, and not about uh, substance. But uh, that is what we've been pretty much doing in this conversation. If not, um, Mandy, thank you for your patience and your support in helping us get through this. Uh, um, assignment appreciate it thank you uh, so the other thing that i just wanted to touch on quickly is that um, i did the best that i could with uh, getting started on a finance committee report because we have to do a report for monday and the monday report in a minimum has to cover the financial orders but i felt like the council hasn't heard seen a written report from finance committee in quite a while. So I wanted to sort of bring the council up to date on what we're doing um, simply because we haven't done it in a while. Uh, but uh, the first part of it I tried to uh, is about the supplemental budget appropriation request. And it is based entirely upon our discussion at the last meeting. And um, that's an essential part. So uh, when we look at the draft that I sent you, any comments about that? Um, I want to put that in context. Um, I'm probably going to be very brief about the library um, and rental registration because of the, uh, just to give the council some sense that we have what we're doing, though. I think that the council pretty well knows about the library because they've been as involved 
everybody else in those discussions. Uh, so that's why there's nothing there is I didn't want to write either one of them until after today's meeting. Uh, going on through the rest of the report quickly, the budget guidelines discussion um, is really just uh, four paragraphs and there are a couple of them are very short paragraphs, um, but uh, should be looked at for accuracy and accuracy of comments and get any comments back to me about it because it's really just to acknowledge that we've started and to give a sense of what, what we're doing and to give it a piece moving forward. Um, the um, items on surplus real property, um, streetlight policy, waste hauler um, are gonna be um, extraordinarily brief because they're just to acknowledge that we were assigned these, that uh, we've taken various levels of uh, work, done various levels of work on them, but are essentially we're waiting for uh, at least for uh, street light and waste hauler TSO to make recommendations. They have decided to put them, uh, both of those policies on their carryover list to the next council term. And so I'm gonna uh, propose that we in, put it on our carryover list to the next uh, council term too, because we don't have the final product to work with for discussion. So um, there isn't much reason to say anything about that. The AHRA report, um, I did have a discussion with uh, Michelle Miller about this um, and because it was also assigned to uh, GOL for different sections of the um, report and uh, GOL had the same problem that we did, that there were a number of questions that GOL and we asked um, that needed to be, uh, to get information from the town attorney, from town staff. Uh, in our case, we also mentioned possibilities of asking for some information from our uh, CPA firm that works for the town, Markham, and uh, from PLS, uh, all of that um, is just not gonna be able to happen within this period of time. And uh, so Michelle's uh, agreement was is that uh, she has no uh, problem with us putting this on the carryover list to, uh, go to the next council term, but she would just like to be able to um, comment on what each of the committees is putting into its uh, its memo. And I thought that was a fair and reasonable request. So I'm proposing that our um, carryover memo, which is the last topic, cover surplus real property, street lights, waste hauler, and AHRA because those are e items that were assigned to us that we're going to not get to. And uh, uh, we do need to do a draft and uh, get the carryover memo uh, to the council. Uh, there is a schedule for that. And I think we're actually a little behind on the schedule, but uh, that's what, the, uh, what I was proposing. So I... Uh, it was, you know, just wanted to report that and uh, see if there were any comments. And then uh, I, I don't really have anything else for today. Lynn. Yeah, just, I'm sorry, just a quick reminder that after we finish the public forum on the financial orders, that we just need to do a quick check-in with the finance committee to make sure that there's no change in the vote. And you did that very smoothly last time, Andy, and we determined at the end of the public forum that they didn't need to stay convened. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay. And it has been posted as a council meeting. At a joint meeting. Joint meeting. Yes. I mean, not finance committee meeting. At yes. For five o'clock when, no, not for five, for 6.30. 6.30 and seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
it's uh, the, five the way o'clock that, is uh, the town manager evaluation period. So not before six thirty. Matt, this is a silly question, but um, maybe it's not silly. I, I was I was surprised today. I know we I know public comment is going to be what it is, but I was surprised today when we when we convened sort of an, a, a quorum of the council that the finance committee meeting felt as though it became a, a full-fledged town council meeting sort of just by virtue of the, the quorum. And, and the conversation was kind of very wide ranging about the merits of libraries as a democratic institution and all these things. And it felt like it kind of lost track of our typical sort of focused discussions. And I'm just curious from those who are sort of in leadership, uh, is is this how I mean? Is this how it always is? In other words, if we if we had a quorum of counselors come to finance, would this all of a sudden just is no longer a finance committee meeting? It's just a town council meeting. It's um, one of the dangers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, we we run into this every year at the uh, uh, budget process where we post right. most of the meetings as council meetings in the counselor so and counselors frequently are not asking. Um, straight budget questions or asking programmatic questions. Uh, but we tend to go back and forth a little bit between programmatic. This was a little bit more in that direction that you were describing because uh, people were just asking programmatic questions, uh, which would be equivalent to tell me why a books order is important, uh, which would have been more typically what would be um but we're getting into the general pros and cons of uh, libraries purposes of libraries are and things like that so it was a little bit more i acknowledge that and so we really don't have a, a track record because this is kind of became a one-off problem that we've not really had a lot of experience with and a good preview for what the council meeting will be like on Monday, I think, safe to say. Uh, when you get to the point with the budget forum, uh, you know, the forum is really for the public to comment to us so that we don't really comment back to them. And on the financial orders, I think it will be pretty straightforward uh, within the context of our normal work and uh so because there are uh you know multiple parts to this uh um public forums are actually three parts if i were correct uh one is the uh there's a requirement in the charter that there has to be a public forum about the budget every year and allow the public to talk about what they think they're they would like to see us um, considering in the budget and uh, we could get a wide range of comments and suggestions and in that that's really uh, for us for thinking of, um, so that we have it as we talk about the guidelines uh, you know, then we might uh, that's why it's being scheduled at the time it is uh, the second part is the uh, uh on since it's uh what we did at the last meeting was all of the orders there um budget supplemental that's a supplemental budget for fiscal year so that's required to have a form attached to it but that will be very specific to the um uh, what we just did at our last meeting which is why uh if it's convened and what I'll just say is if based upon the public forum, any members of the committee feel that we need to revisit the reconsider um, prior um, decisions uh, made to recommend these orders, uh, then I need a motion to postpone consideration of that particular order. If nobody makes a motion, then we, I just say, well, then we have no action to take and adjourn, uh, which I think is what you, has universally happened. And the third part is the public forum on the library request itself, which is also, uh, uh, because it's a new budget request, new budget amount, 
And I think that will be more similar to what we heard. Kathy? Uh, yeah, I'm getting off that topic and just asking for um, clarification. Lynn, at the very beginning, said we have a meeting on November 28th. And then I heard you, Lynn, say also December 1st. December 1st is not on my calendar. So if we're going to do that, someone needs to put it on my calendar. So that's that request. And my understanding, and I started working on it today, and I will get it done this weekend, I started marking up the guidelines, because we've got what you asked last time, Matt, is when are we going to do the guidelines? They are in theory being first draft is being read by the council on the 4th of December. So which is why the 1st of December is on the list. So um, I started working on both looking at a year ago in the most recent past year, redlining. And I, I think I'll be done with it, Andy, by the beginning of next week, just because once I started thinking about it, I could go through with it. But I really urge everyone to look at the most recent. He sent us the Word document, you know, whether you handwrite on it or do anything else with it, because it would be great if we could get to a pretty good draft by going through it page by page on the 28th. Um, you know, maybe we don't get to final, but we at least don't sit there, talk about generalities, but really go, OK, page one, page two, which is Matt, I think those of you who were with us last year, that's the way we went through it. But I'd like to not do a lot of prelude to it, just like dive in. Because <laughs> um, my uh, the meeting otherwise will go really long and we need to get to a draft. And I think that's the main business for the, Andy, I'm, I'm right, the main business on the 28th. And if we also have a meeting on the 1st, that's the big one. I know we have a lot of little carryovers. <laughs> A lot of little carryovers, but so that's, yeah. So that was just a, are we having a meeting on the first and a plea to mark up that draft? Um, Matt's, Matt's got his hand up. Yeah, I, think I did the same thing, Kathy, earlier this week. I started, I started marking last year's and I realized I had more questions than answers though, when it came to, um, you know, net our gross income and things like that. So I don't know if there's any, there's, there's probably no way to streamline that. Pro I mean, that information is going to have to come out in a public meeting. So, yeah. so the mar the market to me is both questions. And I need to know more here, and it would be helpful, Paul, if we could get the um, final tables that are in the guidelines that showed us the actual flow of funds. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, just separated out as a document, so I don't have to go to the end of the presentation because um, the guideline document refers to those tables and it would just be good to have them as their own entity. Um, again, this is for the 28th. You know, I can go back and look at what we what we did, but we always refer as shown in this thing as as shown in that thing. And it's easier to have something to look at when we're writing. So thank you. Um. So, uh, Andy, I'm sending out a thing for people's calendars since Athena is not here, but it won't have a um, the Zoom link. It'll just be to get it on people's calendars. Okay. For the 28th and the first for council yes. for for committee meetings. Yes, you got it. Yes. Remember, my request was we started at two on the 28th because I have another, I think I might be able to make the one, but I know I can make two o'clock. We, we started it at two. Okay, great. Because of that, Kathy, yeah. So, um, and then people, uh, everybody's okay with the carryover proposals for the next term. So um, that said, is there anybody else who has uh, any process or other questions that they would like to bring up? If not, it's been an exhausting day for all of us and an exhausting week. So uh, maybe we should call it quits and say it's time to adjourn. Thank you, Andy. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for sharing. Have a great vacation week, everybody. Thanks.